my background is basically being a musician. I am not a physicist, actually. I'm not a mathematician. I'm not a geologist. I'm not an anthropologist. I'm not an archaeologist. I am a musician that has gone to a lot of festivals. And among the many presentations that I've seen at the many festivals I've been to was this guy, Nassim Haramein, speaking at a festival in 2002. So we're talking 21 years ago now. And he gets up there and starts talking. And I'm like, oh, cool. I'm really interested in physics. And he started saying stuff that was unlike anybody that I've ever heard talking. Because he was connecting geometry and physics concepts that I've heard before with ancient civilizations and even out of this tetra, no, extra tetra real information, <laughs> extraterrestrial information. And this is a great example of ancient structures employing incredibly advanced knowledge of geometry and the solar system and procession even. Because right now you're seeing Chichen Itza in Mexico, uh, step pyramid, and it's in alignment with the setting sun on the equinox. And so the shadow of the edge of the pyramid hits the staircase, makes it look like a snake. And you could see there's a snake head there at the bottom. This shows you very clearly that they had advanced knowledge of exactly how the alignment of the sun works over time. And they didn't build this thing and rotate it in place on the equinox. They had to know from stone one how to build it to do this. It's not obvious at all. Uh, this is a great example showing, you know, this geometric knowledge, you know, where did they get this knowledge? It's, it's very accurate on the equinox. It's, it's not uh, like they fudged this. <laughs> There's also, of course, pyramids around the world. And we've seen some examples of those. I'm just going to show you a few here. This is uh, uh, Teotihuacan in, in Mexico, near Mexico City, 100 kilometers away. And these structures look, you know, similar to Chichen Itza in the sense that they're step pyramids and they're arranged in very specific ways. Uh, fascinating to see that the city of Teotihuacan is at this latitude, 19.47 degrees. And this is a significant latitude because talk about fundamental. The most fundamental thing really is the structure of space, because space is the only thing that's everywhere, no matter where you go. On the universal universal, or even the multiverse scale, space is there. It's gigantic, right? And even down below the size of an atom, down below the size of a proton, to the little energy fluctuations inside of a proton, space is there as well. And so, if you want to talk about the organization or the structure of space, what is that study called? It's called geometry. So the study of geometry is the study of space, the one thing that exists at all scales, everywhere, no matter where you go. So you might think that's pretty fundamental to understand the universe that we're in. Well, one of the most basic essential structures that the universe is making at all scales is a sphere. The sun, the planets, the moons, ultimately the whole universe, likely a sphere. So now what happens if you take the geometry that is made with the fewest number of lines, with the fewest number of sides, that would be a tetrahedron. It's a four-sided platonic solid. It's equal triangles on each side. And if you take a tetrahedron and you put it inside of a sphere and it fits perfectly in there so that one tip hits the pole, the other three points of the tetrahedron intersect the sphere at 19.47 degrees latitude. And when you do that, you've bisected the sphere one third above, two thirds below, or the opposite if you stick another tetrahedron in there, which we will. And so you could see that these pyramids were actually showing you this relationship. That's why these pyramids are the proportion that they are. They're showing you this very specific, important relationship uh, because the pyramid is at this latitude. And you can see that there's gigantic structures on our planet and around the solar system at 19.47, including the big island of Hawaii and Olympic Mons on Mars and the 
great red spot on Jupiter, which has been there since we started looking at it when we invented the telescope around 350 years ago. The storm has just been sitting at 19.47. It doesn't move around. So even on the sun, looking at sunspot activity, you see increased sunspot activity at this latitude, north and south. This is highly significant because the most foundational geometry you can make with straight lines is a tetrahedron, and the sphere is the most fundamental structure that the universe is making. And so this very, very basic, very foundational geomet geometric relationship has been encoded by ancient civilizations around the world. And it, 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 there's even anomalies related to this latitude, like these places where things happen that are hard to explain, like the Bermuda Triangle everybody's heard about, where planes disappear and ships disappear and all this stuff. No one exactly knows what's going on with the Bermuda Triangle. There's other triangles around the world at 19.47. The next most famous is maybe the Devil's Triangle off the southern coast of Japan. But notice there's a triangle number 43 west of Australia over there. The biggest mystery in aviation history is an airplane that disappeared pretty much right in the center of that triangle. And of course, no one ever mentions this uh, being related to these vortexes, but maybe it is. Here's another very fundamental geometric relationship in the universe, wake. No matter what you're doing, if you're moving through a medium, like through air, through water, through space-time, the wake of your motion is going to be at 19.47 degrees and uh, or 19.5. And no matter how fast you're going, that's the angle. So these are very fundamental relationships. If you start looking into people that were honing in onto geometry a while ago, Buckminster Fuller stands out. And he's the one who came up with this idea of a perfectly balanced space-time, or the, at least perfectly balanced space. And Sim Haramain translated Buckminster Fuller's work in geometry into the physics because he was trying to explain this perhaps biggest conundrum in the history of physics, which is when we look at the quantum scale, at the tiny little vacuum fluctuations that make up space-time itself, it's incredibly energetic. There's 10 to the 93 grams per cubic centimeter of energy density of these vacuum fluctuations inside of a cubic centimeter of space. It's massive, massive, massive amount of energy in just the smallest little cubic centimeter of space. But that seems strange, right? Because here I am moving my hand. I know there's air here, but if I was floating in the vacuum of space, I don't feel much energy density going on in there. How come I feel nothing if there's all this energy in space time? Well, that's a very, very tough question to answer. Physics does not have a good answer for that. And in trying to figure that out, Nassim Haramein theorized that perhaps the structure of the space itself is so perfect and so equal and opposite in every possible way that no matter where a force is or where a force is coming from, the structure of space itself counterbalances that force, equals it out, and it equals zero. So you've heard about the zero point field. That's what we're talking about. The zero point field, the quantum phone, space, space time, the ether, any of these terms is describing the same thing, which is that everything is an extension of the space. The space is fundamental. Matter happens sometimes, but space happens all of the time. So what geometry would be perfectly balanced in every possible way? This looks fairly balanced. This is Buckminster Fuller's isotropic vector metric. It's uh, just not symmetrical because inside of those tetrahedrons, you have these cavities. So then if you take two of these structures and you push them together like this, then you have a star tetrahedron with a total of 40 tetrahedrons. And now you have a perfectly balanced geometry that's been formed on the inside of these two tetrahedrons, together called a star tetrahedron or a Merkaba, a Merkaba. There's meditations related to this. And that's the reason for this is because this is the most seed fundamental code geometry of the structure of space-time itself. Inside of that star tetrahedron, you get this geometry in red. This is the only 3D geometry that has 
all the sides the same length and the vectors that go from the center of the geometry to the edges are also the same size, the same length as all the edges. Every line in that geometry is the same length. That's why Buckminster Fuller called it the vector equilibrium. The geometry term for it is a cube octahedron. It's eight tetrahedrons pointing in to a single point. So 12 around one. You've probably heard of 12 around one before. Esoteric and non-esoteric. So here's the thing, though. What does that mean? That the universe is one gigantic cube octahedron? It's got to be fractal. It's got to be able to get bigger and bigger and bigger to the size of the multiverse and smaller and smaller and smaller down to the size of the Planck, the Planck length being the shortest possible measurable distance because it's the diameter of the smallest possible photon of light. Thank you, Max Planck, for figuring this out. So from the Planck to the multiverse is a lot of orders of magnitude so many orders of magnitude so maybe it's cube octahedron inside of cube octahedron inside of cube octahedron and it goes russian dolls forever style all the way down and all the way up so let's start putting more tetrahedrons on the outside of this what happens if you put four more tetrahedrons onto each point of a star tetrahedron you get to a total of 64 tetrahedrons and then you get to two octaves of this perfectly balanced geometry. It's a cube octahedron inside of a cube octahedron, perfectly balanced vector equilibrium inside of a perfectly balanced vector equilibrium. And that's the fewest number of tetrahedrons that you need to start to see this infinite fractal division of space-time. Then it goes 512, it goes 124, 1024, and it goes infinite from there. Computer programmers in the audience are nodding their heads right now because this is the structure of memory in our computer systems. And it happens to be the geometry of a lot of things related to biology and ancient civilizations, architecture, and encoded, uh, you know, incredibly uh, knowledgeable databases, things like the I Ching, the Bible, the Torah, the Quran, but we're going to get there. This is showing you that this geometry is a three-dimensional structure. Eight star tetrahedrons put together gives you this 64 tetrahedron grid. The seventh one has a one behind it. This is kind of a computer animation of a 64 tetrahedron grid. You can think of it like music. You got an octave and then you get to the next octave, 64, and the next octave, 512. Just like in music, you have a note and you go up seven notes. And when you get to the eighth note, just like the eighth star tetrahedron, you get the octave. So this is a octave relationship in the structure of space-time analogous to the octavization of vibration and uh, the string motion in music in a piano. Uh, we're using this geometry all the time in our daily lives, just through our music and through uh, our visualizations that we're already starting to tap into thanks to the esoteric traditions from thousands of years ago that have encoded this information all the way through the generations to where we are now. The space-time is not flat. This is showing you flat space-time. I know it's simplification, but I think the kids are ready to see 3D animations showing that space-time is actually curling and falling in in every direction. So it's not just this fabric flattening of the space. And a black hole being this infinite curvature of space-time is not just some funnel that just disappears. So it's not that a black hole is a giant cosmic sized vacuum cleaner that sucks everything in and it disappears and goes into another dimension. A black hole is a three dimensional object. It's not a funnel going to a point. It has an equal and opposite and it's spinning like water going down the drain. When you pull the plug out of your bathtub, the water doesn't just go straight down. It spins because there's an energy density gradient and the water and the air are different densities. And so they're trying to equalize. And when they pass by each other, they spin. The water spins down and the air spins up. This is what happens in all black holes as well. So energy is coming from both sides and then spinning out and it forms a toroidal shape. So black holes, and this includes the atom, by the way, because 
Nassim Haramein's theory includes the fact that black holes are basically all there is and that a proton is a black hole and that there's a black hole in the center of every star and there's a black hole in the center of every galaxy. And so it's scalar black holes all the way up and all the way down. And they're forming a dual torus shape where information goes in across the event horizon, which is the boundary condition around the singularity of the black hole beyond which you can't escape, including light. That's why they call them the black holes. And the information goes in and it gets spun back out again. It doesn't just disappear. And then it goes back in and it goes back out. And so you get a closed loop system and all the information that falls into a black hole gets encoded by the black hole. And you can see only the information on the event horizon. You can't see into the black hole. And so this is very important because this is just starting to describe not only cosmological black holes, but the black hole that is the proton. If the proton is a black hole, then there are tiny little uh, quantum scale black holes rotating around each other at the speed of light inside of every atom. And you're made of quintillions of atoms. So we literally are beings of black holes. We are in the structure of space-time resonating with the information of the field of space-time itself. This is how information is exchanged across all scales. This is how the universe is keeping track of itself and not getting confused. We're confused. The universe is not confused. The universe is keeping its structure very, very organized and it's not changing crazily over periods of time. It's staying together. The big stuff is made of small stuff. So anything cosmological size is actually made of atoms. Everything is connected literally by the structure of space. That is not an esoteric statement to say everything's connected or that we are all one because there really is only one thing. It's space time doing its thing. And it gets very, very chopped up. It gets very, let's say, it gets very isolated in some ways because space-time has its balance and where there's an imbalance where you find a vortex because there's a density gradient in space-time from the cosmological scale down to the quantum scale. At every scale, space-time is spinning. So here's spinning space-time basically at a diameter of hundreds of kilometers. And here's spinning space-time at a diameter of tens of thousands of light years. And here's spinning space-time at the diameter of microns, the carbon particle. Space-time is doing this and matter is doing this at all scales. And then nature is mimicking that field patterning. And you see it in things like plants and agave and shells and turbulence when you're flying in an airplane and algae blooms off the coast of Ibiza and the spiral arms of our galaxy. This is the old picture of our galaxy. Nassim Haramein likes to show in that movie Thrive by Foster Gamble that the galaxy is actually stars that go out towards the halo of the galaxy and come back in and then spin back out again. The sun takes about 250 million years to go around the galaxy. And so because the sun is only around 4 billion or the earth is only 4 billion, but the sun is only about 20 galactic rotations old because <laughs> it's 240 million for each rotation. Now, this is, this is where Nassim is showing that all these toroidal structures are nested inside of each other, that the human heart has a toroidal energy field and so does a star and so does a galaxy and so does the atom that we are embedded in this spinning vortexes of space-time spin inside of spin inside of spin when i was a kid they told me that the earth was going around the sun in circles and so i was imagining when i was 10 years old that i had gone 10 times like this but that's not accurate the sun is moving and it took nasim to be one of the very first if not the first person to animate the solar system moving. This animation is nearly 20 years old and he had to get the best animators around at the time to use the best computers available to make that animation. People have taken that animation and then improved upon it, but it's basically showing that the sun is moving through the galaxy as the galaxy rotates. The 
planets are spiraling around the sun as it moves. So every planet is making a helical structure and each planet is making a different size helical structure because they have different orbits. And so here's kind of a 2.0 version of that. And I'm very much looking forward to the next level of this where you can just play with this and uh, you know zoom in and out. If it doesn't exist already, I'm surprised. I just haven't dug in to find it yet. But you start looking at the geometry of motion and the geometry of our solar system over time, and you see that these fundamental geometries related to the platonic solids and the most foundational geometries you can make are starting to emerge just from the periodicity of things like Venus and Earth here. This is our more modern view of the uh, galaxy that came out only, I don't know, a decade ago or something like this. NASA put it out and it was pretty interesting to see that they're basically showing now that there are 50,000 light year emissions of gamma rays and X-rays coming out of the galactic center, forming a gigantic dual torus. I thought it was pretty cute. They used the same color that Nassim used for his animation. And isn't that awesome that your baby picture looks pretty much like the galaxy? We all started as a sphere. And when the egg got fertilized, boom, we're a dual torus. Literally, <laughs> our physical beings were a dual torus, which matches the structure of black holes at all scales. Then our cells start to divide and they don't just divide randomly with blobs of cells sticking off. There's a very specific geometry to our cells. When we get to be eight cells old, we are a cuboctahedron. We are the vector equilibrium. We are the geometry of space-time itself at another fractal level. And then it goes on until we're 64 cells old. And not until after you get to be 64 cells old do your cells start to bifurcate, where one cell becomes a skin cell and one becomes a nerve cell, et cetera. This is very fundamental to the structure of biology as well as space-time. Here's showing the relationship between the star tetrahedron and putting a sphere around each one of those tetrahedrons. The sphere and the tetrahedron are the most fundamental relationship, like I was showing with the 19.47 degrees latitude with the, with the pyramids. Um, if you put a sphere around each tetrahedron in a 64 tetrahedron grid, then you get a 3D flower of life symbol. And this is the symbol that you've seen around the world. The nodal points of where these spirals overlap is giving you the points of the star tetrahedron. This is showing you the visualization of the spheres and the tetrahedrons together. Seed of life. This is the torus, the accretion disk of the information coming out mostly along the equator. That's why our galaxy has like a record waves of stars. It's not flat. It's more like the surface of an LP vinyl record with grooves on it because it's all cymatics. The entire universe is the structure of matter is basically the resonating of the structure of space-time. It's the cymatics of space-time, if you will, which is cymatics being the visualization of frequency or vibration. So biology is the feedback mechanism for the universe to learn more about itself. Where information comes into our consciousness, we are able to quickly assimilate and learn and gain new information and then change our environment. This is uh, the universe being extending itself out to the very edge of what it can do and creating more coherency. So we are basically like antenna of information and our codons of our DNA, and we have 64 of them just by coincidence, or maybe it's not, we are encoding this information that goes way back through time where our ancestors have encoded experience into their DNA, genetic memory, biological memory, and it goes through generations. We've done tests and seen that trauma can be sensed by uh, generations born seven generations after the trauma, even though they never experienced the original source of the trauma. So it's a much more subtle and much more mysterious universe than the, let's say, traditional standard model physicists are talking about in universities right now. The C word is not the normal C word in 
physics. The C word in physics is consciousness. They do not want to say consciousness. As soon as you start talking consciousness in the context of physics, a half of the audience of physicists start to roll their eyes and they say, oh, well, that you can't quantify consciousness. So we're not going to go there because we need numbers. We need facts. We need data. We're not doing um, theology here. And so it's unfortunate because <laughs> this dichotomy happened a long time ago, the separation of church and science. Science and church have been saying the same thing for a while now, but there's not a lot of people that are talking about the philosophical and religious and spiritual and the science at the same time. Fortunately for us today, we have those people on this multi-talk uh, panel of, the, of this epic series that we're doing here. Um, basically tying together all these loose ends because there's all these different disciplines that have connected the dots, but now we need to connect those dots and create even more coherency and try to get our act together. If we don't get our act together, it's going to get pretty dramatic pretty quick. We know we're making mistakes in what we're doing. We're pulling structures out of the ground and putting it into the atmosphere that shouldn't be there. And we're changing our local environment rather quickly. Thankfully, we're starting to realize that and we're starting to make adjustments. But I feel like by us understanding the most foundational principles of nature and applying that to our physics, applying that to our methodologies across all disciplines, applying that to the way that we think about ourselves and our own personal disciplines that we do on a spiritual and you know even physical level with things like yoga and exercise then we start tapping into the foundational structures of the universe and hopefully we then learn to resonate and vibrate in coherence with the universe instead of pushing up against stuff breaking stuff trying to destroy things. We've seen a lot of folks get very confused because they've been told things that do not feel in alignment with what their actual day-to-day -day life experience is. They've got parents or religious figures or a guru or an organized religion or an organization or a corporation or a media outlet pumping people with information, being like, this is the deal, this is how things work. And then all these folks look and feel and go inward. And they're like, that doesn't make any sense to me. It doesn't make sense because it doesn't, because they've decided to, you know, take on ideas and thought forms that are not in alignment with nature and the way the universe is working. And that's why we're seeing such incoherence today and so many people making very misinformed decisions including things like my book says this and your book says that and we're not happy and so you've got this war happening in the middle east right now and gosh i'm going to show you here in a little bit about how all this information is actually encoded deep into both traditions uh, the Islamic tradition and the Jewish tradition and the Christian tradition. And not only that, other more ancient civilizations prior to that, and the knowledge has been passed down, the knowledge of the structure of the universe being passed down into ancient civilizations and all the way through time to our generation now, into our biological structures, into our societal structures, very fundamental ratios like the phi ratio is encoded in many different ways, in spirals, in branching, in the um, the wake that I was showing you earlier. This is Rafael Arujo from Brazil, great artist, showing kind of the architecture underlying the spiral and the curve. The universe does not make tetrahedrons. It makes spheres. But if you pack spheres together perfectly and they overlap, the fundamental geometry that centers all those spheres is a tetrahedral geometry, which is the vector equilibrium. We're starting to realize we should probably learn from nature and employ some of the techniques that nature does, like putting our solar panel field in the shape of a spiral and a, a phi spiral, like a sunflower, because it's the most efficient way to get the most amount of light to the most surface. We're starting to do this also with um, CRISPR, 
editing genes and editing the DNA molecule, which has this very fundamental structure related to uh, phi and the structure of space-time, and all these traditions in religion from thousands of years has, have encoded these same kinds of geometries. I really like this image because it's showing you very basic vibrating water with different frequencies of sound. Those are the cymatics uh, images, cymoglyphs at the top. And then you have all these various mandala images from various uh, religions, from Catholic, Aztec, Egyptian, Hindu, and then the CERN particle accelerator. And then you've got all these DNA molecules. Basically, just giving you that sense visually of how everything is connected through geometries, fundamental geometries that ancient civilizations have been aware of for thousands of years. These are 3,000-year-old platonic solids found, I think, in Scotland. These are the platonic solids. Take a sphere. You put spheres around six of them because they that's how many fit around this one circle. And then you put another circle after that you get a total of 13 circles and you connect the center points of all those circles it's called metatron's cube and you can get each of the platonic solids emerging out of that structure tetrahedron octahedron cube icosahedron and dodecahedron and the dodecahedron is right at the right um, angle that if you put a cube inside there it intersects with the points of the dodeca so all these structures are actually related to each other and embedded. This is the first image ever taken of an individual molecule, and those hexagonal structures are individual atoms. We did this probably over a decade ago. This was done by IBM initially. Now we have electron microscopes and quantum microscopes that can see down to the atomic level, and we're starting to be able to build molecules, and we're starting to edit DNA with CRISPR. We're really starting to get down into the very basic fundamental properties of matter at the smallest scale. Things like probability patterns of where subatomic particles are gonna be sitting. Now let's jump to the Great Pyramid because Egypt has these gigantic structures. This is not a tetrahedron. This is a half of an octahedron. An octahedron is one of the platonic solids. It's a pyramid in a pyramid. This has a square base, not a triangular base. There's quite an incredibly elaborate structure on the inside of the Great Pyramid. This is not just uh, some people throwing some stones together and then cutting a hole and digging a, digging a, a tunnel or something like this. The traditional Egyptology story, which was originated by Western, you know, European explorers going to Egypt in the 1800s, they were like, oh yeah, dynastic Egypt, the dynastic Egyptians, the pharaohs, the, those guys must have built this. This must be Khufu's tomb. Really? <laughs> I, I still don't understand. Like, we know where the pharaohs are. They were all buried in the Valley of the Kings. They were not buried in the pyramids. There's no mummies in the pyramids. No pharaohs were found in the pyramids. That's the only statue ever found of Khufu, three inches tall. I don't think Khufu built the Great Pyramid. I don't think, you know, his son built Khafre Pyramid and then his son built the Menkari Pyramid. That's the story, is that a pharaoh became pharaoh. He said, oh, damn, I better start getting my tomb together because it's going to take a while. And, you know, my lifespan at 5,000 or 4,000 something years ago is only about 45 years old. So I've got about 20, 25 years to get my tomb done, start building the pyramid. And it took them 20 years supposedly to build this, really. <laughs> 2 million, 300,000 stones in 20 years. You're laying a stone every few minutes, 24 hours a day. I don't think so. You wouldn't be able to place a stone every minute, never mind carve them and move them to the site. It's so accurate, you guys, it's beyond, beyond. And it goes really, really deep, the geometry and the mathematics encoded by this structure. First of all, it's eight-sided. It's not even four-sided. You can only see it at certain times uh, on the equinox when the shadow is just right. So ju I'm just talking about the Great Pyramid, never mind the other pyramids. But let's take more look at the Great Pyramid. The half base of the Great Pyramid is a square whose perimeter is equal to the circumference of a circle with a radius equal to the height of the Great Pyramid. That is not a coincidence. There's only one size pyramid that does that. And then it gets even more crazy when you realize that the angle of the sides from the corner 
it's 42. And on the faces, it's 5184. Well, those angles match the angles of incidence of where you see a rainbow in relation to where the angle of the light is coming to hit your eye. Is that a coincidence? I don't think so. <laughs> the circumference of the outer circle placed around the outside of the Great Pyramid space and minus the circumference of the circle placed inscribed inside the base, if you subtract one from the other, you get the speed of light. How in the world were the ancient Egyptians aware of the speed of light? How did they even know? That can't be a coincidence either because it goes beyond that. It turns out that the actual latitude and longitude line of the Great Pyramid itself is the speed of light. The latitude of the Great Pyramid is equal to the speed of light in meters per second. How are ancient civilizations having profound knowledge of physics when, according to what we know, no one was able to measure that in any possible way until maybe a hundred years ago or something is when we figured out speed of light. And we're still not sure exactly, exactly what it is because it may change. Everybody thinks it's absolutely constant. As far as I can tell, nothing is constant. And even the things that we call constants change, but they're changing very gradually over a long period of time. So the longest straight line that you can go on land on earth is from Western Africa to Eastern China and Giza is at phi on that line. That could be a coincidence. Sure, I guess. This is Robert Edward Grant's work on all the pyramids of the Giza Plateau, as well as the pyramids at Dashur. So the Bent Pyramid, the Red Pyramid. And he's looking very closely at the slope angles of all these pyramids. And it's very involved, it involves a lot of mathematics, but I can just say the bottom line is that the pyramids are encoding fundamental geometric ratios that relate to music. Yes, integers. These are expressing integers. So Robert did all these calculations and took the uh, height and the uh, base length measurements and looked at the ratios of height to base, giving you these different angles and analyzed it and translated it into vibrations based on a tuning uh, temperament that he created called precise temperament tuning, where you start with 432.081 Hertz, not 432, a tiny, tiny bit different than 432. And then you do um, a very specific type of tuning regimen, starting from A being 432.018, I believe, and might even be on this chart. Yeah, 081, 432.081. Uh, very fascinating. Um, it's gotten to the point now where pianos and even orchestras have tuned to this new tuning system. And it's unbelievable because it's very resonant. It's different and it's very bright. I encourage you to check that out. You can look on Robert Edward Grant's YouTube channel for the 432 uh, precise temperament tuning playlist. This is Robert using GeoGebra, which is a geometry program where you can program in basically any geometries, looking at an analysis of the pyramids and tying together so many things, you guys. Uh, it's I, I, don't, I obviously can't do <laughs> the Sid Maramades Unified Field Theory and the work of Robert Edward Grant and the work of Alan Green, who's figured out that William Shakespeare encoded a bunch of this information into his works. You start to see the connections between the solar system the geometry of space-time, esoteric traditions, the work of masters like Leonardo da Vinci, the flower of life, more modern discoveries like the Mandelbrot set fractal, music, cymatics, it's all connected. Here's the Bent Pyramid. The story of the Bent Pyramid, the traditional story, is that they started building it and went, oh no, it's going to be too tall. We messed up. It was a mistake. Let's change the angle for the rest of it. And then they changed it. They literally tell you that. You're on the Giza Plateau 
And some of these guides are like, oh yeah, they made a mistake. They were still working on how to make these things and they didn't know what they were doing. No, <laughs> that is incorrect. Alan Green figured out that they were very deliberately changing the angle there because they're giving you another very fundamental structure in biology, in, in, in the universe itself. It's called the relationship between a hexagon and a pentagon. And in chemistry, especially biological chemistry, and if there's anybody studying th for their finals in biochemistry, they're pulling their hair out right now because of all these geometries of molecules in biology where it's a five and a six. And so this is what this is showing you. This is showing you the hexagon, and this is showing you the pentagon. And these angles are tight. Like this is very highly precise. Alan has done a great job measuring this in great detail. And here's another insight from Alan Green, you guys. This is beyond, beyond. This is the cover of Shakespeare's sonnets. You're like, oh, cool. It's covered with a couple lines and some stuff on it. But then Alan started looking at this very closely and he's so observant. It's unbelievable. He's like, wait, why is there that big dot next to the G? And then there's two small dots and there's that other. He started connecting the dots. Basically, you can draw a circle on the front of this thing and connect the end of those two lines with all the dots that are in all of the punctuation of all those um, words. And it starts to give you fundamental math and physics constants, including some that weren't even supposedly discovered yet at the time of Shakespeare's writings, including like the euler mascheroni constant and phi and pi and the Bruns constant and phi minus one. So it, it's it's beyond. <laughs> And he also shows that basically that cover is encoding for you a coordinate that all of these lines are showing you the earth and it's pointing to the great pyramid of Giza. And again, the all things point back to the great pyramid. So how is it that Da Vinci and Shakespeare all encoding information related to the pyramids? This is the sonnets. These are Shakespeare sonnets. It's forming a pyramid. He purposely, he, meaning whoever Shakespeare was, Alan Green has figured out that Shakespeare is not Shakespeare. Shakespeare was not a, a guy. There was nobody named Shakespeare. Um, you know, there's no tax records from Shakespeare. There are no letters from Shakespeare to anybody else. That was a pseudonym. And there was a group of people putting out work as Shakespeare, including John D., Edward de Vere, and Francis Bacon, at least. This is a shot of a group of us uh, with the Sim Haramein and Resonance Science Foundation visiting the Giza Plateau. These are incredibly large blocks at the base of the Menkari Pyramid. And notice the erosion on those blocks. Um, Robert Schock thinks that it took at least 80,000 years of erosion to, to have that kind of uh, weather erosion, because that's mostly water erosion. And we obviously know that there's not been a lot of rain in, in North Africa for quite some time. Apparently, every 20 or 25,000 years, the Northern African uh, Sahara changes from being lush and green to desert to lush and green to desert. And they've seen that in the sediment that uh, falls from the windstorms off of the west coast of Africa in these layers. They can see that it used to be green. And so the Sphinx erosion is you know, famously Robert Schock and John Anthony West pioneering that work that the Sphinx is probably a lot older than has been le us led to be believed. Um, these are incredibly large stones that are just on the floor, basically right next to the Great Pyramid, or actually this is next to the Khafre's Pyramid. Those lines are showing you where individual blocks are placed. These are hundred plus tons, some of them. And people don't even notice, you know, you're with all these guides and they're like, look at the pyramids. Meanwhile, you're seeing stones that we would have a very hard time moving today. Let's look at this traditional story for a second. When I was in probably sixth grade, I think I had a teacher that was like, oh, let's talk about the pyramids and showed us these pictures of the slaves pulling these rocks up this ramp. Turns out the ramp would have more stones in it than the pyramid, and we don't find any of these stones anywhere. This story is not correct. Let's just say it. This is not how it happened. They get crazy. Some people are like, oh yeah, they put platforms on the outside and moved them up like this. This is the biggest crane I could find a picture of. And we're having a hard time moving stuff that's that size. We need a crane this big with diesel fuel and modern technology. 
maybe you could lift something bigger if the crane doesn't have to move. If the crane just sits there, then in a boatyard, you can put the hull of a cruise ship uh, or the, the bridge of a cruise ship down onto the hull of a cruise ship. And if you want to move something really big, you need like 150 wheels and, you know, you can barely move it and you have to close roads and it has to be perfectly paved and you have to have a diesel truck. This is how we move giant things today. We have no idea how they were able to move these blocks. They were not doing this pulley system and they didn't have ramps on the inside of the pyramid that we haven't discovered yet. This is all theories of Egyptology without thinking physics, without thinking of the logistics of how this actually could have worked. Doubtful that they had a column of water and they were floating these blocks up the side, all sorts of fun <laughs> theories come out about what they were doing. I mean, maybe they use sound. We can levitate styrofoam with sound, but we're not exactly able to levitate, you know, tens of tons with sound yet, but maybe that's a thing. But what was the real purpose of the pyramids? You know, those guys, uh, JJ and Desiree just talked about how they thought it was an energy production uh, device and that it could have been a, a water hammer and water could have come up through the subterranean chamber. Christopher Dunn wrote this book. He's a power plant. He's another proponent of the theory that the pyramid was for energy production. Perhaps Nikola Tesla understood what the uh, aquifer underneath the pyramid was uh, doing by amplifying the electricity generated naturally, piezoelectric effect of water moving over crystal of the quartz. That's a lot of what the Giza Plateau and sandstone is made of. And so Tesla was trying to amplify electricity and send it wirelessly. We probably didn't have to put all those telephone poles up around the world, but of course they wouldn't have been able to make any money selling us poles and wires and putting a meter at the end of the wire. So the powers that be went in a different direction and Tesla got squashed. But we're now in the days where we're rediscovering this ancient information and connecting these dots from esoteric information to religious information to physics information to engineering and technological uh, marvels that are happening in real time as we speak. Um, it's an exciting time to be, witness the return of ancient technologies. This is the Baghdad batteries. We know that people understood how to generate electricity thousands of years ago and they could use it to electroplate things to cover things in gold. We find a lot of ancient stuff covered in gold, which is a great conductor of electricity. Uh, so the pyramids are likely a combination of a spiritual device designed to help you tap into the subtle realms of the universe, let's just say, because there's so many different frequencies of energy vibrating across the electromagnetic spectrum. And we see and hear about one ten billionth of the information that rides the electromagnetic spectrum. So it's uh, it's not fair to say that we think we understand what's going on. It's like you're looking through a cocktail straw at the universe and moving your hand around a lot and saying, oh, okay, just add up everything we've seen in this tiny little sliver and say, okay, this is the nature of reality. We probably don't know. <laughs> What is the, wait, what's going on in this picture? That's the Ark of the Covenant. If you look in the Bible, they say very, very clearly, okay, Moses, this is the deal. You got to build this box. It's called the Ark and it's got gold in the outside and gold in the inside. And it's an energy device. It fits perfectly in the sarcophagus. Is that a coincidence? Robert Edward Grant standing next to the sarcophagus looks down. Wait, what's that? There's an alpha and an omega embossed on the lid or on the rim of the sarcophagus. Next time you're in the king's chamber, go to the back side of the of the sarcophagus looking out towards the rest of the chamber and then down in front of you on the right side near the right corner there, you'll see these two uh figures, Chinese pyramids. There's pyramids all over China and they're laid out in a very specific arrangement. Look at that. China and then Giza and then Yucatan Peninsula and Mexico, and then the stars in the belt of Orion, all having similar alignments. This could be a coincidence. So those three pyramids I just showed you, those complexes actually make that same kind of alignment, even though I know we're on a sphere and everything, and it's not just a straight line, but still <laughs> the fact that step pyramids, the triptych doorways, the gable cor corbel arch, the mummification, 
we're talking across the world, ancient civilizations were doing the same things, building the same things, in some cases having same symbology for their, you know, deities and things like this. Now let's look at China. Let's go to the Forbidden City. This is the Fu Dog guarding the entrance of the Forbidden City. You've got the Fu Dog in China. You got the Sphinx in Egypt. Both are this dog cat kind of looking guy. Wait, what's that guy? What's the what's the what's the Fu Dog have under his paw? Oh, a proton. It's a 3D flower of life. A 3D flower of life is the geometry of the little quantum vacuum fluctuations that are oscillating inside of a proton. 10 to the 60 of them. That's a one with 60 zeros. Planck scale, tiny little oscillators, Planck spherical units, you could call them. And they're all overlapping, creating those little pedal structures, the Vesica Pisces, 3D style. Michael Evans calls that the trion ray, a three-sided solid with curved lines, not straight lines, but you can get a three-sided object by having a point and then three petals and it comes back to the point. And you see, boy, do you see that in nature everywhere, right? So why is the food dog protecting that? That's, he's protecting the knowledge. He's protecting the information. This is the most fundamental information there is, you guys. If you understand the proton, if you understand the singularities and the black holes and the dynamics of space-time, then you understand light, you understand time, you understand gravity, you probably then understand propulsion and how to take yourself across the universe. So if there are ships flying around with folks in there that figured out how to do that, they must have figured that out a long time ago and they must have been working on it for a really long time. And it's not hard to imagine. The Forbidden City is showing you including the statue in the back of the Forbidden City that has this proton looking thing with these bows <laughs> and these ribbons. And Nassim saw that. He said, oh, look, they had to tie it down so it wouldn't fly away. And sure enough, that's the theory, right? If you understand this structure, you might be able to make a star. You might be able to make a little sun. And if you had a structure that was resonating with the structure of the vacuum, then it would probably have a gravitational effect. It could levitate. And you'll notice when you go to Egypt that all the entrances to the temples has a sphere. It's not a circle. It's a sun disk. They'll say it's a sun disk, but it's actually a sun sphere. If you go to Karnak, there's a ruined arch that's one of the biggest ones. And the bigger the archway, the more convex the sun disk is, showing you that it's a sun sphere. It's an actual sphere. And it's not just a sphere. It's a sphere with wings. The sun disk with the wings on the entrance to all the temples is showing you that they had a technology that understood how to harness gravity. We have figured out how to harness an invisible field <laughs> that was very mysterious to us. We would see lightning and go, what's that? What's going on over there? Benjamin Franklin, right, with the kite and the, the key and trying to figure out how to get electricity to come down to him and stuff. Now we've got electricity going into our devices and I can sit here talking to you and think of something and move my lips while my vocal cords vibrate the air between me and the computer's microphone. The microphone hears the vibrations in the air, translates that into electrochemical impulses going through the circuitry of the computer, transmitting it wirelessly to my router. My router talks to this dish sitting in my yard, which then talks to satellites. I'm using Starlink. And then these satellites are going around the earth and then translating that stuff back down to routers on the ground and then into your computer and into your speaker and vibrating the air between you and your computer. And then it's vibrating the hairs on the inside of your ear. And it's making these little electrochemical impulses in your neocortex. And it's firing all these neurons. And then you're going, oh, cool. I understand what he's saying. That is unbelievable. That is a miracle all the way up and down from the biology to the technology. The fact that we're starting to crack these codes that ancient civilizations might have encoded information that came from another tetra, extra tetra, real information being given to us oh, then we could build this thing and then we could have control over gravity and then we might be able to move really heavy objects and align them perfectly and 
cut them super accurately and leave clues to, for later generations that we understood this structure, we understood the geometry and the dynamics of space time, that it's an infinite tetrahedral grid array and that all black holes are toroidal vortex dynamics and that everything spins inside of spin inside of spin from infinitely large to infinitely small 122 orders of magnitude in energy density gradient physics doesn't understand that they don't understand it so much that they call that the vacuum catastrophe because it's a catastrophe that they have no clue how the quantum vacuum can be so dense and the cosmological density be so not dense. We have new, new information coming out from James Webb Telescope saying, oh yeah, check it out. Here's this giant galaxy that has all these stars, a huge fully formed galaxy that's only 300 million years since the Big Bang. That is not supposed to have happened. That messed up all of them up and they're all going back to the drawing board and going, uh, oops, maybe the universe is 13.82 billion years old. Maybe it's like 26 billion years old now. <laughs> That's what they're, they're, we're rewriting the textbooks as we speak because the James Webb is the most accurate uh, utensil that we've ever had to measure anything. And it's unbelievable the information they're getting back. Meanwhile, go around the world and you're like, oh, here I am in Bangkok, Thailand, and they also have this proton 3D flower of life. It's everywhere. You start looking for flower of life and you start looking for these geometries, you find it everywhere. Let's go I Ching style, right? How many codons are there in the I Ching? Or how many hexagrams, I should say, are there in the I Ching? 64. They're either six solid lines or six broken lines. The only thing you can make with six solid lines is a tetrahedron. And what do you need to make the opposite tetrahedron pointing the opposite way so you can get the star tetrahedron? You need six broken lines. So the I Ching is giving you the most foundational geometric information that you need to build the structure of space-time itself. And I doubt that that's a coincidence. I would guess that the I Ching is encoding this information. The yin-yang is encoding the double tube torus dynamics of a black hole. Nassim, again, had to pay animators over a decade ago to animate uh, a yin-yang to show that this is actually the dual torus dynamic of black holes at all scales. So this would be the Earth, the Sun, the galaxy, the universe, the energy field surrounding your body, the proton, the atom. This is foundational. And so, again, if you can understand the geometry and the dynamics of space-time and internalize that into your biological structure, into your consciousness, and then translate that into your actions, what you do on a daily basis, and your methodologies, and your practices, and your music, and your art, you can create highly resonant structures, and it resonates with other people, and they like it. <laughs> it's called beauty. It's called art. It's called expression. We're seeing this information being encoded all over the place, in all scales, in all cultures. And there's a tradition that probably predates dynastic Egypt, predates Mesopotamia, predates Samaria, and that is a culture that was destroyed by a cataclysmic event. One of our greatest uh, evidences of this today is the Assyrian temple in Abydos, uh, down the Nile a couple hundred kilometers from Egypt, I mean from uh, Cairo. These are massive megalithic stones. This is nothing like the temple that is above it and off to the right. That's the Osirian temple. Uh, I'm sorry, that's the King Ramses uh, temple. And King Ramsey probably found this temple and said, this place is awesome. I want my temple next to this temple. And so they built their temple. But this temple is so old that it's down below the level of the sand because we're talking geo geologic time buried this thing over time. This is seriously anomaly. Uh, you've got 60, 70 ton stones that are sitting tongue and groove on top of other ones. So they had to be lowered down. They couldn't just be slid across. So now you're lowering this stuff. You're not just moving it. You're not just pushing it. It just shows you like they're daring you to try to figure out how they did it. And then you can start to see this very accurate as well. The, and then there are these puffy structures coming out of it off the stones kind of looks like Cusco Peru so you see similar structures in Peru and in in North America in South America in 
Asia, in Africa, all around the world, megalithic structures. This is the flower of life on the side of the pillar there in the, in the Assyrian. I got there just in time to take this shot before the sun uh, went away. Uh, this is when I first saw it, blew my mind because that's very highly accurate. You can't just draw that freehand. If you've ever tried to draw the flower of life, you know how difficult it is. There's Nassim Harami with Foster Gamble, the guy who created the Thrive movie. And that's uh, Mohammed Ibrahim, uh, very great Egyptologist and guide in Egypt. Uh, this is back when he had unfortunately broken his arm. This is graffiti on the other side of that same column. You can tell it's nothing like the flower of life. It's super accurate. You can tell that they understood the geometry of space-time. 64 tetrahedron grid with a sphere around each tetrahedron gives you a 3D flower of life symbol. So there's the Egyptian symbol, and here's the solution for how that creates quantum gravity. Each one of those little Planck spherical units, 10 to the 60 of them, packed together to create a proton, which is a tiny little black hole. And protons inside of atoms are black holes orbiting themselves. So flower of life, you've seen it. A million times it's now permeated into our culture it's all over the place and it's even in ancient civilizations all over the place look how accurate that is that is not just red ochre this is almost like the atomic structure of the granite has been altered and it's just there you can't rub it off flower of life around the world in one minute <laughs> flower of life is all over the place even in india at the golden temple even in cathedrals, even in Tibet, all over the world, culture is showing us this overlapping spherical waveforms. Again, this is the foundational geometry of the proton. Even Leonardo da Vinci was encoding it. So I'll leave you with this idea. Maybe ancient information came from off of our tetra, ancient civilizations, pre-cataclysm, pre the younger dry cooling period that happened after a comet hit North America 12,500 years ago, that civilization passed information down through the survivors of that cataclysm. And it got encoded into stories that went around the Mediterranean and led eventually to Egypt and eventually to the Bible and eventually to Muhammad and to the Torah. And Da Vinci went from Italy to Egypt and learned a bunch of this information, brought it back to Europe. And then it got passed down through the works of Shakespeare into the Rosicrucians, into the Freemasons, to George Washington, who designed the dollar bill, who put that pyramid on the, on the dollar bill with the eye. That's a very fundamental relationship too. And so check out the work of Robert Ever Grant and Alan Green and Nassim Haramein, because they have cracked the code of various aspects of this. This is Robert's work showing that inside the flower of life, you get the relationship between the meter, the cubit, and the yard. Turns out the imperial measurement system, the Egyptian cubit measuring system, and the metric system are all related. They're not random. That's profound in itself. This was alluding to those stones in all these places looking similar, like in Cusco. This is near Bolivia. This is back to Egypt. They were using some sort of ancient technology to carve this rock. This was not done with a little pounding stone. The last thing I want to leave you guys with, though, here is this important image showing that all religions are related to each other. This is the history of a religion. Notice in the center of this image, you'll see the Jewish star and the Islamic uh, crescent and star and the Christian cross. And they're very close together, those three religions, in one of those branches. Thank you guys. Much love.